I think we like to focus on a lot of the data that exists out there, but there are so many gaps in the data that we have. And I'm, I'm really interested in that as well. What are the stories that we're not telling with data and how do we tap into that to create a more equitable society? And I think, you know, that's a broad statement, but there are really specific ways that tools are being leveraged to collect data on spaces and people that are oftentimes missed. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Inner Wealth, the Forbes Ignite podcast. I'm your host, Nicole Kakal, CEO of Forbes Ignite. And every week I'll be sharing with you my conversations with unique, creative, and innovative people across all different industries. These are people who are intellectually curious explorers who are also redefining what it means to be successful today. From personal to professional, we cover it all to understand what drives our guests to blaze their own trails and create nimble solutions within the industries that touch each of our lives. Our guest today is Marissa Asari, Head of Product Design at Benchy AI, an organization funded by the Gates Foundation focused on AI for equitable healthcare. Marissa is an incredible designer that blends data and design in her work to create an impact. She uses her talents in STEM and the arts to build positive momentum beyond just charts and graphs. It's the kind of visualization that weaves together a narrative to showcase the best strategies for social impact. We talk about everything from leveraging data for good, the cognitive way data visualization affects our brains, storytelling with data, and more. I know you're gonna love what she has to say. Here's our chat. Hey Marissa, how's it going? It is so wonderful for you to be here and thanks for joining. Thank you so much for having me. I'm I'm so happy to be here with you. And you know, we've been doing great work together, but it's great to, you know, have some time to sit down and, and just chat about everything. No, honestly, it's been such a privilege to be able to work with you. And we've had quite a lot of interaction together. And I always thought this woman is sharp. So why are we not having a podcast together? <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I, the feeling is mutual, absolutely. <laughs> So I've always wondered, because since we've known each other, there have been quite a lot of changes. I mean, you've been juggling a lot of amazing work. And personally, you made that move from the Bay Area to Germany, which is amazing. So I'd love to know, how have you been? And what have you been up to lately? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the how have you been question is so loaded in the pandemic, right? It's such hard times. And I think it's been really tumultuous. It's been a really fascinating time in my life personally. Like you mentioned, making that shift from the Bay Area. I was actually in New York at the height of the pandemic. I went back to the Bay Area where I grew up to visit family. And then I actually made the move over to Germany in the middle of the pandemic. And so it was really getting to know a new place. Uh, it's a place that you actually are familiar with as well. I know mm-hmm. that you grew up close to where I'm living now in Heidelberg or Mannheim, Germany, which is also incredible that we share that connection. And I think it's also helped in some ways to have that change, to be able to focus on it as the world is sort of going through so much in so many ways. So personally, I'd love to know how did you get to where you are today and what inspired you? Yeah, I I love this question because I I think everyone's story is so intertwined in in where we are and who we are as people. And it oftentimes gets left out. And I think my story really started actually from my parents. So my my parents come from really different backgrounds. My mom is from Colombia. She was born there and moved at a young age to New York. My father is Japanese American. And so, you know, both immigrants are the children of immigrants. And I grew up sort of intertwined between these two cultures and sort of straddling this space where, you know, my Colombian side of the family is very lively and, you know, you have this Latin culture of sharing and of food and of love and language and warmth. And I think my dad's side of the family with Japanese culture, also incredibly beautiful, but has a lot of structure and and rules and intricacies. I think there's so much to it but sort of creating a space where those two cultures can exist in the same household in a way that sort of synergizes, I think is really where my my origin started, is where I sort of started to shape who I am, was navigating those two spaces. I grew up in the Bay Area in, in Oakland, California, which is a place that has changed tremendously over the years. I mean, being so close to Silicon Valley, to San Francisco, to tech, the landscape of that area has just really changed, you know, displacement, gentrification, a tremendous amount of wealth there, but also a tremendous amount of poverty and a tremendous amount of inequity. And so I think for a lot of my life, I felt in between a lot of different worlds and I was able to be exposed to a lot of different life experiences in, in that way as well. So I think the diversity of the community that I grew up in and getting to sort of witness firsthand 
the power of technology and also the power of technology to sort of promote inequity in a way really shaped me sort of unknowingly. I, I didn't know from, from a young age at all that I wanted to be uh, in the technology space whatsoever. I went through high school and undergrad, um, ended up staying locally close to home at, at Berkeley for undergrad. And I studied public health and I was planning to be a doctor, to go into medicine. And the connection there was always to be connected to other people and to help other people. And, and that was what I was really interested in. But I, I came at a crossroads when I actually started working in undergrad at a research lab that was at the intersection of public health and urban planning. And I would say this was a huge pivotal moment in my life because I was so set on, you know, going to medical school and reaching people in this way and working in that space really opened me up to the different ways that you can work on structural change, even in the health space. And so I was exposed to, you know, working with large sets of population data, trying to understand health inequities, why certain people and certain populations get sicker than others and how that really is tied to the structures and the policies that we have in place. And so this really shifted my mentality around what it means to have impact and sort of bred my love for both data and for data visualization, which is what I focus on a lot now, and also equally public health and sort of focusing on health inequities, structural inequities. I got to the point where I wanted to really think about how do we also communicate what we find in academia and in research and all of that in a visual way. And so that really led me to my journey on you know, getting deeper into visualization, into the technology space as well. That's amazing. I love that story. And thank you so much for sharing. So tell me more about data visualization and the data ethics and working at the intersection of data and design. That's so interesting. Yeah, it's an incredible space to be in. And I think, you know, it's really interesting. There's a lot of folks who focus heavily just on the data piece, on the data side of things. We have incredible data science work happening in the world. And then we have a lot of people who are super creative and think a lot about design. And I think blending the two is incredibly powerful. I would say data visualization as a whole is an incredibly powerful tool. And I think the somehow the easiest way sometimes to look at it for me, and sometimes the saddest way also is to, to look at historically how data visualization has been sort of used to promote inequity and actually reinforce negative things in our society rather than positive. And from looking at that and from understanding that and acknowledging that, we can actually sort of pivot and actually try to understand how we can leverage it for good. But, you know, if we look at the way that data has been used, for example, in reinforcing racial residential segregation, for example, so redlining, we think about, you know, the data that was used to deny certain people or certain groups of people loans, et cetera. We can look at the way that data is used today to reinforce policing in certain areas and the way that sort of machine learning and, and AI can be used in really negative ways that sort of reinforce prejudices. So we can see already just by looking at some of those examples that data visualization is incredibly powerful or data just in general is incredibly powerful and it can be used for bad and it can also be used for good. Um, but I think sort of acknowledging that piece of it is really important to actually leverage it in a positive way. But I think the way that I like to think about it is actually thinking about the, the cognitive way that data visualization impacts our brains. So there's a lot of research that's been done on, you know, what are the actual effective ways to get people to understand information that's really complex? And so you could look at you know, the different styles we might use to measure differences. So there's cognitive differences between, for example, looking at something that is a position on a scale versus the degree of an angle or the curve of a line or the color saturation that you might see in a map. And so there's a, a sort of a gradient scale at which our brain can comprehend the differences between information across those different types of visual elements. And so the trick with data visualization is actually leveraging the way your brain perceives information and actually putting that into something that is driven by data. And there's something really incredible about that. And I think it's also important to say for folks who are sighted, for folks who have the ability to see, oftentimes we're, we're visual people by nature and we're taking visual cues all the time in the directions that we see in our lives and the signage. So we're inherently already consuming so much visual information that if we're able to leverage the way that our brain perceives it, we're, we're in a really good position to, to explain complex information to people in really exciting ways. Wow. That is incredibly powerful. And so essentially 
your use of data visualization for a tool for change making and as a resource to make things more equitable, inclusive, especially in the social justice area. I'd love for you to talk more about that and the work that you're doing in that. Yeah, absolutely. There's an incredible data visualization, well, not just data visualization, but artist in the technology space called Mimi Onuoha. And she she did an incredible project I think called Missing Data. And so it talks about all of the missing data sets in the world. And so, for example, we can think about the census that oftentimes misses huge swaths of people and communities. We can think about, you know, communities that don't oftentimes get surveyed in, in normal research. And so can we leverage those tools to be more inclusive? And I think at the same time, think about the implications of that and the ways that communities have been harmed in the past, because obviously there's a lot of mistrust around data collection and data privacy. So those are also things that I think are important. The work that I'm doing right now, I I most recently uh, made a transition into a role as head of product design at a company called Benchy AI. That is an organization funded by the Gates Foundation focused on AI for equitable healthcare. So as I was mentioning before, my passion for public health, it really all comes together with visualization in this role and at this organization. The idea is to really take and leverage the latest in personalization technology. So you can imagine, for example, Netflix or Amazon have really incredible personalization engines or recommendation systems, right? And a lot of technology companies are leveraging this kind of AI and machine learning to essentially sell more things. And so what I love about Benchy is that we're sort of flipping that on its head and saying, can we leverage the latest in AI and and ML technology, but actually do something positive with it? And so the idea is to make that technology accessible, particularly for organizations, nonprofits that are building mobile health applications, and, and particularly in low and middle income countries. So thinking about applications that can help, you know, track patient care, manage care in areas where folks might not have access to care, where it might not be affordable. Can we actually leverage that technology to help the users of those applications, which might be frontline healthcare workers, patients themselves? So that's some of the work that I'm doing at Benchy, which has been really exciting. And then I've been doing a little bit of other work with an organization called Data Culture. And we recently actually partnered with Parsons, which I know we both have ties to. You teach at Parsons. Um, I also did my master's there. And we launched last year a racial equity initiative with Parsons School of Design with their master's of data visualization. And the concept there is to create a sort of new fundraising model for equitable scholarship, essentially, and fundraising for fellowships in that program and, and for Parsons. So We're partnering to provide data visualization and design services to partners who are really interested in doubling down on their impact and essentially the proceeds from those projects and from that work go to fund scholarships in that program. I think that's a brilliant model because you're not only tapping into nonprofits, but also to corporations in terms of whether or not they want to contribute as well. And it helps fund those scholarships. So I think that's a brilliant, brilliant model. So this is a perfect segue, actually, into storytelling with data. In your work, what are your values when it comes to the principles, practices, and processes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we could go in depth on a whole podcast for every single one of those, (laughs) I think. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, I think principles would be first, do no harm. And maybe this is coming from the the, uh, health space. I think there's so many considerations in thinking about how we work with our data. The second would be really to think about how you can start first with your audience. I think always starting there. So really thinking about who am I speaking to? And if I can understand that always first then I can tell the best story possible. I think oftentimes we end up telling the stories either that we want to hear or that others in our immediate space or bubble want to hear. And so if we can first identify who the audience of of our story needs to be with the visualizations that we're creating, I think we're off to a really good start. I think really considering, again, like I said before, how does the brain process different types of visual information? And so selecting the right type of visualization for the data that you have is really, really critical in that. In the space that I'm in, the audiences for my visualizations and for my work are oftentimes really different. So I need to spend a lot of time understanding which visualization might be better for a given project or for a given visualization. And and I think really sitting with this is really important. I think in terms of processes, 
being involved as a data visualization developer from the process of actually collecting data and understanding how that data is structured is really important as well. So not just being sort of the end consumer of that data that that packages it up, but rather somebody that's along for the entire process to understand why data was collected in a certain way, who it was collected from, and maybe who needs to receive that data or that information back, I think is also really important. Again, I could speak at length about (laughs) all the different techniques and, and ways that you can go, but there's also really fantastic resources out there right now because data visualization is such a growing field. There's really great tools online that can help you learn data visualization, that can help you sort of integrate best practices into your work. And I think at the end of the day, collaborating with others is always the best way to go because other people are going to see things that you don't. And that's what always helps me the most. No, oh, absolutely. So tell us about a project where it perfectly exemplifies these principles that you've just described right now. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to talk about a project. I think this is actually a perfect moment to maybe speak about a project that we were recently worked on together, which is the project on cognitive diversity, which we called the Ignite Project. And we worked with a really amazing, cognitively diverse group of researchers, of leaders, of other data visualization experts to bring together this study on cognitive diversity and sort of what makes teams successful, particularly in moments of crisis. And so we looked at decision-making around the pandemic. This is a really timely moment, I think, to have this study. And we worked on it, you know, over the course of the last year, which I think, you know, being at the height of the pandemic and really understanding how this is impacting teams is so critical. So the project we did was a study, and maybe you also want to say a little bit more about it as well. I'd love, I love your input on it yeah, because it's such a big role in sort of moving that forward. But again, yeah, the study was to, to bring together leaders and have them do exercises together with cognitively diverse folks and different roles. And so we had them do a Pymetrics assessment that had assessment of different traits, cognitive traits. And then we assigned people into different groups that were either cognitively homogenous uh, or cognitively diverse and had them do a series of tasks together. And what I also really loved about that was that, you know, myself and my colleague, Neil Oliver, who's also involved in the visualization part of the, the project, we were involved from the start in the data collection and we really felt integrated into the team. And so we got to collaborate with everyone on how do we shape this? What are the questions we want to ask? What's the kind of data that we want to collect? And that was incredible. I think we got really clear from the outset on who the audience was, right? So business leaders, folks who are really trying to think about how to lead their teams, how their teams work together, and sort of folks who could really benefit from understanding the benefit of all types of diversity in their teams. And that really helped from the outset. And then I think the process of you know collecting that data, going back and forth with folks who are more focused on the data science side of things, who are really running a lot of the analyses that we did. That was also an incredible experience. And and then, yeah, my colleague and I, Neil, we really collaborated with all of the team on how can we then bring this to life in a microsite. So this microsite is actually going to go live pretty soon. Mm -hmm. And it's a site that really sort of captures all the work that we did in the project, showcases, I think, really beautifully the findings that we had in a way that are sort of clear and easy to digest and that just showcases all of the work and sort of packages it and, and provides it for, for the general public to engage with. So I'm, I'm excited for, for the world to sort of engage with it and, and for, for this to be something that Forbes Ignite is, is putting out soon as well. No, you and Neil did an incredible job. And I think it's so important for this project to see the light of day. And the fact that we did it in the first place is because we want it for not just corporations, but leaders and academics and scientists to understand how teams react to responding under pressure. And so there haven't been a lot of studies around that. And we wanted to take a citizen scientist approach to this to involve as many different diverse minds into the input. So I think you were a key player in that. And we, we thank you so much for doing that. Oh, no, thank you. It was such a pleasure and, you know, such a great team. No, absolutely. In terms of the work that you do currently with data culture, apart from your work that you already do as head of product design at Benchy, tell us about some projects there. For instance, I think you talked about working on a project for vote.org. Yeah, the vote.org project was really incredible. The, I mean, first of all, the work that vote.org does as one of the largest voter registration and get out the vote organizations in the U.S. is just so impactful. And we had the pleasure of working with them right after the 2020 election. 
cycle, which was a huge year for them. I mean, you know, turnout was record breaking and the effort that they put into getting out the vote and helping people register in that year was really significant. And so the work that we got to do with them was actually building out again, another micro site that showcased their 2020 impact. And so we started by really taking all of the data that they had from what they'd done in in that year. And it was an incredible process to really see them also reflect as an organization on the work that they did. It was an exhausting and I think an emotional roller coaster of an experience. But to have sort of this qualitative and quantitative data about the work that they did was amazing to be sort of privy to that and and see them sort of reflect on that. And so we did a series of processes to understand what that data showed, to really measure the impact and to show it in a way that was creative and engaging for folks. I think a big fear around the 2020 election was that there was so much turnout and then there was so much exhaustion afterwards. And so for organizations like vote.org, I think a huge question was, how do we continue that momentum? How do we keep people engaged in our processes, in our democracy in some ways? And how do we get funders and people who are interested in donating to see that that momentum is still important and that we can continue to to sort of grow in that way? So those were sort of questions that we wanted to help them answer. And through a design process, we had an incredible designer um, working as well on the project to create some of the visual assets we developed a microsite that really captured the different ways that they'd impacted across the United States. So focusing on different geographies, on different groups and demographics that they've worked with, on ways that they've creatively gotten out the vote, radio campaigns, social media campaigns, and, and different ways that they've sort of gotten creative, even food trucks, which was sort of incredible to see all the photos that they had from that across college campuses, for example. Some of that was obviously difficult to do in the pandemic, but essentially we were able to package that all into a microsite that was data visualization focused, right? So thinking about how do we show numbers in impact? But when you look at the site itself, it's impact.vote.org. I don't think it reads just as charts and graphs. I mean, it's very visual, it's very creative. It's more focused on just telling a story. and, And that's the kind of visualization that I'm really passionate about. It's the kind of visualization that's not just about one standalone chart or one standalone graph, one standalone map. It's about weaving together these different pieces into an actual narrative that has, you know, a beginning, a middle and an end. So I almost like to approach the work in terms of creating an essay or outlining sort of a a story that you want to tell in that way. And then mapping that to the best visual strategies to relay that information. And in this case, it turned out to be some part writing, some part, you know, creative digital assets with photos, images, vectors, et cetera. And then we did have, you know, charts and graphs and maps in there as well. But overall, it was a fantastic product to work on. They're an incredible organization and I feel lucky to be a part of the work that they did. I'm sure they were so lucky to have you, Marissa. You've done such incredible work and a lot of the work you do is so impactful. And so what would you tell someone who is interested in going into data visualization? Yeah, I I think again, like I said before, there's so many resources out there right now to get involved in data visualization. And there's a lot of different routes you can go with it. I mean, there's a lot of people who are in visualization who are more focused, for example, on business intelligence. So they might be doing analytics and tools like Tableau or Power BI or Looker, things like that. I would say Tableau Public is a great place to start if you're interested in playing around with visualizations in a tool that's already really structured. I know a lot of people start there. There's a lot you can actually do in Google Sheets or Excel, for example, just to create charts and graphs. If you're interested in uh, geospatial data and in mapping, getting to know QGIS or ArcGIS, these tools are incredible for sort of getting yourself acquainted with mapping as well. So there's incredible amounts of resources and tools out there right now that provide that foundation. And I would highly recommend getting involved and and sort of just playing around with those. That's the best way to start is to just learn by doing. So setting up some projects for yourself. There's also so many free data sets out there right now that you can sort of just play around with and think about how do I slice and dice this data? What's the most interesting way that I could group it? Do I want to look at it over time? Is, is there an interesting trend that I want to, to sort of investigate further? And so I usually start my visualizations there anyways. And I think starting there is a great place. I think also 
networking and and getting the lay of the land across the data visualization space. The Data Visualization Society is an incredible organization as well. And they have an open Slack community that I highly recommend that you can sort of get involved in. They have a ton of channels about different topics, about sharing and showcasing work, connecting with other people in the data visualization space, looking for open positions, great resources as well on data visualization, best practices and guidelines. They recently started a conference, so there's a lot happening there. (laughs) And otherwise, I think, you know, really to get into the field, I would also start to think about what's the kind of visualization that you want to do. So thinking about, do I want to go into more of the analytics space? Do I want to tell more custom stories? So the work that I do is really more custom data visualization, where I'm thinking about one narrative, one story that I want to tell. And another part of the work that I do is really product oriented, right? So if you think about building a product that includes visualization these days, a lot of applications do. They're going to show you historical trend data of how something is engaging with that application or the purpose of that app itself is to provide summary information or historical data. So there's all these different layers of data visualization and sort of paths that you can go on. And I don't think you necessarily have to choose one. And that's sort of the beauty of it. I sort of like to dip in and out of those different spaces when I always come back to, in the end, some of that custom data storytelling, um, as I mentioned, but, but there's a beauty in doing a, a lot of different things. And tell us more about the master's program that you did. The program that I did at Parsons School of Design, which is the master's in data visualization, is also an incredible program because you can really learn a lot of skills in a short amount of time. Before going into that program, I had never coded in my life before. Wow. And that's so hard to believe. (laughs) Yeah, it was incredible. I mean, I'd never, I'd never touched a line of code before and I didn't know anything about programming. And what was really nice about the program is that they have people from really different backgrounds professionally and personally. So There were people who are really focused on design, had a lot of experience in design, but had no experience in programming. That was more of my experience. There are also people who are really fantastic coders and have a lot of experience in programming, web development, things like that, but don't have necessarily the data science background, for example, or working with large sets of data. And then there were other folks who were data scientists who had a ton of experience programming specifically for data analysis, but didn't have any web development experience and also didn't have any design experience. So the beauty of the program was that there were people uh, and peers from all these different spaces who could share their different skills with each other. So the folks who had more design experience would lean on the folks who had more programming experience for that and vice versa and sort of swap on supporting each other. So it was a really incredible program. And I think the program itself is, is unique. It's one of the, the first and potentially only still one, one of the only STEM programs, master's programs at Parsons. And I think having STEM mixed with arts and the creative space is just incredible. There's so much richness there, again, in, in this exploration of the quantitative and the qualitative and the creative. And so it's a really nice blend of all those things. So I highly recommend it for folks who are interested in the program itself. There's a great alumni network as well. Folks who are always happy to speak about their experiences and connect with others. And there's also a lot of great options. You know, that master's program isn't the only one. There's fantastic boot camps available online these days, other programs at a graduate level that offer these skills. So I would say for anyone who's interested to really think about what's the best thing for you, what is the best thing for your use case, um, for what you're interested in doing, For the master's program that I did, they also offered evening classes for folks who are currently working. And so you could actually do the master's while working full time, which of course is a huge (laughs) lift in terms of workload, but for some people really works a lot better. And so I also appreciated that they are thinking about sort of the different career paths that people might have and the different journeys they might have to get into this field. Did you happen to have any mentors or any Anyone that inspired you to do the work that you're doing today? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) I've been really lucky in this regard. And and I would say one of the most influential things in my life have been some of my mentors from UC Berkeley, my time as an undergraduate there, my time in public health. I had two really incredible mentors. Jason Corburn was an incredible mentor and still is. He uh, led the Institute of Urban and Regional Development at UC Berkeley, which is where I worked and fell in love with public health and urban planning and how to work with data. Mahasan Mujahid, who is also 
a professor of public health at UC Berkeley, is an incredible, incredible epidemiologist, also focused on racial inequities in public health and health equity in general. And her work has been really influential for me and just her mentorship as well. I would say that there's people that I've been really inspired by along the way in terms of doing this work. Coincidentally, my father also does data visualization work. So he's a graphic designer and you know, growing up, I never really thought of going into this space whatsoever. And so we joke that some of it came into my life or into my brain through pure, you know, proximity or (laughs) some sort of osmosis that we didn't know about while I was sleeping. It sort of snuck into my brain (laughs) without me knowing, but actually sort of reconnecting with my parents in this way has been really incredible. So both of my parents are creative, they're educators in the creative space. So they teach in the arts and reconnecting with them and being really inspired by the work that they do in their fields the way that they care for their students and the work that they are so committed to doing, and particularly from the backgrounds that they come from and the communities that they represent as well, the perspectives that they represent. That's been really influential for me in in thinking about the ways that I want to show up, what it means to sort of honor my own heritage and my own history and my own journey, and to also encourage others, particularly other women and women of color, to, to honor that too, and to bring that, bring their full selves into the work that they do. So that's been really inspiring for me. There's incredible people in the data visualization space that I'm inspired by. People like Ikenia Joma, who does incredible um, data art. People like Nadia Bremer does incredible work. Visual Cinnamon is her website. She has fantastic data visualization work, and she's done great work across, for example, The Guardian and other pieces. So you might have been familiar with her work without even knowing it. W.E.B. Du Bois actually has an incredible or did an incredible work on data visualization. And that was recently published in a book called Data Portraits, I believe, Visualizing Black America. And it's a really incredible insight into the visualizations that he created that were largely unrecognized before. And so when you think about foundational people in the data visualization space, that's one that coming into the space actually really surprised me and also really inspired me as well. So there's so many people in the space that I've been inspired by. And then also, of course, the people that I've been able to work with on a mentorship or one-on-one basis that I'm just utterly grateful for. But I love what you said about, you mentioned that basically it all came full circle with your journey career-wise and how you ended up being inspired by your, your parents and closing the gap between what you were working on previously and bridging that with the creative side. And so I think that's incredibly special. So this is a question that I actually ask every single one of my guests, and I would love to know your answer. Generally speaking, how do you define success? Hmm, I love that. And it's something that I'm actually defining and redefining all the time myself, actually. I would say the way that I would define success is carving out or building a life that's intentional that brings true happiness and that actually brings others along in that journey and in that success. And one that probably also rejects any type of success that might be fed to us as something that we need to adhere by. So thinking about material success or superficial success in the way of having that one job or making a certain amount of money or reaching a certain amount of recognition. I think we can all define success in different ways. And there's parts to that that I think can be part of our individual success goals that we set for ourselves. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But I think questioning the reasons that we've been taught that there's only one way to be successful in this world is really important in defining what success looks like for us individually. So I think that's constantly changing for me right now. It's really about finding a balance between my personal and professional goals and finding a way that I can be my whole self in that success. So it's really about just being being truly me in all the spaces that I'm in. And for me, that is that is success because I think there's a lot of systems and a lot of practices and a lot of paradigms that don't want us to do that. And so it's, it's an act of rebellion and rejection of that in some way to just show up and, and do that. And I, I hope that, you know, I've been inspired by other people who are doing that too. And I hope that, you know, others can also find that as well. That is so well said. It's an incredibly dangerous thing to have success defined by that one thing. Yeah. That by one very rigid definition of success, 
that is pretty much archaic. If you look at a certain level of income only, or if there's that just that one job for status purposes, for example. So I think your answer was so spot on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. I, I'd be curious to know what it is for you too. I know that you asked this on your podcast to most of your guests. I'd love to know for you, what, what does success mean to you? Honestly, my definition of success is so aligned with what you just said. It is all about showing up as yourself every day in whatever you do and being happy with that and inspiring others to be themselves as well. So I really feel like that has a long lasting effect rather than chasing after that one thing. Yeah, absolutely. And it makes sense. I mean, in the work that we've done together and all the conversations that we've had, I, I, I feel like that really comes through. And yeah, I'm, I'm curious too, like how that shows up and in, in how you define success for Forbes Ignite. How does sort of like your personal take on, on defining success and also your teammates at Forbes Ignite, are there ways that that sort of comes through? Yeah. So my mantra I don't know if this is a mantra or anything like that, but my belief is that everybody is creative and it might take a certain level of unlearning. It might take a certain level of relearning how to be creative again, or I let that shine through because creativity is the cornerstone of innovation and you can't really achieve true innovation or be free to do that without being free to be creative. And so I believe in every single one of us, we have that in us and it's my mission to let that shine through every single person that we interact with, that we work with, and that we can help. I love that so much. I, I really do. I mean, just being sort of, again, at that intersection of the, the creative and the quantitative and the qualitative, like how do we drive impact and how do we move that forward, but also not forget the parts of us that are just so creative and also see that those are the parts of us that actually drive the work forward. Sometimes I think we we try to ignore it or we try to just focus on the quantitative and just moving the work forward. And we forget those really special parts of us that are just yearning to be creative or yearning to create in different ways. And it's been incredible to also work with the folks that you brought together at Forbes Ignite, because I think it really comes through truly creative people, people who are creative in really different ways. And I think that's really unique. Thank you so much, Marissa. That means a lot to me. (laughs) And I know that means a lot to the team too. Well, Marissa, it has been such a pleasure speaking with you. And this has been such an enlightening conversation. And I had been looking forward to this all week. So I hope we get to do this again sometime soon. Thank you so much, Nicole. I really appreciate it. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. And I'm, I'm happy anytime to have a conversation like this with you again. So thanks so much. That's it for this week's episode of Inner Wealth. I hope you enjoyed our conversation and that you'll join us next week as we continue to explore all the ways success is being redefined in our ever-changing world. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast on your favorite podcast app. And follow us on Instagram at Forbes Ignite for more thought-provoking content and opportunities to engage with us. I'm your host, Nicole Kakal. Thanks for joining us.